Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 408, the pre-GAFCON edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Nall, and today is June 13th, 2018. Well, I, I hope our audience is figuring this out. GAFCON's coming out. I just did an interview with uh, Archbishop Peter Jensen, and we're going to do another uh, talk here with uh, Stephen Noe talking about preparations and what to expect from GAFCON. Now, Stephen's special in the fact that he's gone to GAFCON 1, GAFCON 2, I think you were at Lambeth 1998, and uh, you have this kind of special knowledge base uh, about the communiques and what uh, uh, GAFCON wants to communicate. You were also part of the, the team that helped write uh, the Jerusalem Declaration. So that's the key to why I wanted to get you on again before GAFCON. Um, first, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, I've got my bags half packed, uh, but uh, still working here from home before uh, we're getting on the plane on Friday. That's great. Uh, I'll be flying out as well on Friday. Um, every time we get to the meeting, um, it's about, in my estimation, 70% fellowship. You're catching up with all the people you've met over the years. You used to be the vice chancellor of Uganda Christian University, and you know a lot of the folks that are on the ground there. And I always wonder what happens behind the scenes. How does uh, a Jerusalem Declaration or a communique uh, like a primate's communicate, when do they get time to write these things? Well, um, perhaps I should begin by saying, uh, Kevin, that I'm a member uh, of the statement group, mm -hmm. which does prepare the uh, final statement. I was uh, on the group in 2008 and again 2013. So those of us who are tasked to produce that final statement end up often holed up in a room somewhere uh, <laughs> pulling uh, a series of all-nighters uh, before the draft statement comes to the uh, to the floor of the conference uh, and then once it comes there there's another uh, series of all-nighters where we take the revisions that have been suggested and put them out in into the final uh, proposal uh, that comes to the uh, to the to the conference. Now, in contrast, having attended all three uh, two previous GAFCONs, your communiques and statements actually have something to do with the meeting that occurred. I watched something kind of out of Canterbury or the the primates meetings, and often the communique is completely different than what occurred at the meeting. How do you uh, keep the two together? Well, I think probably I would say trust in the Lord and His Spirit. Yeah. Um, uh, Archbishop Peter Akinola said in 2008, uh, right at the beginning of the conference, he said, I want you to know that the statement from this conference has not been written, that we in fact are uh, listening to the voice of God through this meeting and will seek to be uh, uh, loyal to that. And, and that really was true. Uh, although there had been some discussion beforehand on some of the issues that came out and some of the principles, for instance, in the, in the Jerusalem Declaration. There was no formal text that we started with, and that was also true in 2013, and it's true this year. Uh, we have a group that's been appointed, uh, chaired by Archbishop uh, Davies of Sydney, uh, and with a number of, and a diverse group of senior leaders and scholars but we don't have a text which we're ready to just shoot down the uh, uh, d down the passageway to the to the convention. We're waiting to hear. In fact, um, you might be interested to know we have actually uh, had a, a questionnaire that was sent to all 2,000 uh, delegates um, to get their opinions going in to the conference um, and. Um, uh, we're beginning to tabulate those responses. This was done again in 2008 in a sense of where do we believe God is leading this conference? And the same is true today. Well, let's just talk up front then. Um, where do we believe that God is leading this conference? Uh, it's the third iteration of this movement. Uh, 
largely the leadership of the Anglican Communion has sought to ignore you. They've called you a ginger group. Um, they don't really understand why there needs to be a GAFCON because they think they're doing just fine. Um, what are we going to be looking forward for GAFCON 3? Well, maybe let me just share those questions because I think you'll get a sense of the direction sure. from those. So the first question is, uh, do you believe that Resolution uh, 110 of the Lambeth Conference in 1998 represents the unchangeable standard of marriage according to our Lord? So that, we, when that sense, we're, we're reaching back into the past and we're saying we are trying to be faithful to the teaching of Scripture, frankly, of Jesus himself who taught about marriage, mm -hmm. and also as it was stated by the Lambeth Conference in 1998. Now, that question, I think, assuming we get a very unanimous response, and I think I can say we do, is saying that the issue which led to the tear in the communion, uh, in fact, goes back to the breach and the violation of that by the Episcopal Church and, of course, by a number of other churches since then. So we have to go back, in a sense, to that fundamental question. And it's, of course, a question of Scripture also. If Scripture teaches marriage and abstinence as God's design for human sexu sexuality, we as a church have no authority uh, to violate it. So that was the first question we asked. And it, Lambeth 1998, where I was, did a couple other things that are, I think, maybe worth mentioning. First of all, it was a resolution passed, written and passed by the Global South. The Global South uh, had been gaining strength uh, prior to 1998, but they never really had, had been able to speak their own voice. Lambeth Resolution 110 spoke the voice of the Global South overwhelmingly, and all of the movements that came later, such as GAFCON and the Global South Network, Anglican Network, have all remained absolutely committed to Resolution uh, 110. One final thing about it. It was a resolution. Yes, it was. There's a whole history back to 1867 of the Lambeth Conference stating the mind of the church on matters of the day. Some of them are rather trivial. Some of them are, out, some of them are outdated. But occasionally, they actually say something of real substance to guide the communion. And that was what Lambeth 98, uh, 1998 did. It's interesting that uh, it, the Lambeth Conference in 2008, there were no resolutions. There were 44 pages of in daba daba do. Yes. Uh, Amazing stuff, yes. <laughs> and that, and, and, and yet, it was actually GAFCON that did produce a document, uh, the, you know, the Jerusalem Declaration and Statement, which did have theological content. And in that sense, I believe that GAFCON is the true continuation of the Lambeth Conferences. Well, would you say that maybe Lambeth 1998 was the last Lambeth then? The last one meeting in England. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I would say so too. And uh, what about the last primates meeting? Yeah, I would, I would say the last primates meeting was uh, in 2007 at Dar es Salaam. And again, it's interesting because another development of Anglicanism in the last part of the 20th century was the, what they call the enhanced role of the primates. Uh, the primates meeting was only really started in 1978, but successive Lambeth conferences wanted to enhance the role of the primates, um, and that was stated clearly in 1998. Well, after the human sexuality re resolution passed and the Episcopal Church thumbed its nose at it and, in fact, consecrated Gene Robinson, the primates said, well, we need to rise to the task. And so there were a series of primates meetings which said very clearly uh, that this was unacceptable and that the Episcopal Church needed to repent. 2007 was the grand finale where they actually gave very explicit uh, conditions uh, to the Episcopal Church, which was to be mediated through the Archbishop of Canterbury, through Rowan Williams. And it was when he reneged on every one of those conditions, I think he felt that maybe the primates had been enhanced too much. 
No, and, uh, I, I do. I remember him flying out to the House of Bishops meeting here in uh, Louisiana, and boy, we thought he was finally going to at least do something. Yeah. Well, uh, and yeah. So it was when he reneged on that and invited the whole Episcopal uh, House of Bishops, minus Gene Robinson, to Lambeth, that we had the formation of GAFCON. Mm -hmm. It was his failure to carry through the primates' resolutions that essentially led to the separate. And so now we have a separate GAFCON primates council, which really does exercise a kind of conciliar authority. So again, I would say that 2007 was the last uh, primates meeting connected directly under the Archbishop of Canterbury, but in, in fact it's continuing under GAFCON. Now I've seen this more and more. A lot of people feared that you know GAFCON would always just try to fit under the strictures of uh, the instruments of uh, unity and stuff like that, and always try and be uh, Anglican light. And more and more, I'm seeing the leadership and the primates uh, of GAFCON say, "If Canterbury is not with us, we're going anyway." And I see this more specifically in the last couple of months when I see Justin Welby choosing sides. He's basically said the Episcopal Church is fine. The presiding bishop, Michael Curry, can represent the Anglican Communion anytime he wants to. And he's put the, the Episcopal Church you know, on the, on the stage of international Anglic Anglicanism, uh, in the world stage. And I, I was speaking to Peter Jensen the other day on, on video, and he's like, we don't need Canterbury. Right. Well, I think if we look at the statements, for instance, mm -hmm. in 2008, the statement from Gafcon acknowledged the historic role of the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury, but went on to say that the, the true source of Anglican identity has to do with our commitment to the Holy Scriptures as interpreted through the ancient fathers and written in the uh, formularies of, uh, of, of the Church of England, the 39 Articles, the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, that was our true identity. Having said that, there was, I think, a token of respect to the role of Canterbury and its historic role. In 2013, Justin Welby had just you know, acceded to that uh, throne, and I think there was hope that given his evangelical background and commitment to renewal and, and reconciliation, that he might in fact uh, move in the direction of GAFCON. I think the last five years have demonstrated that he is no different than uh, Rowan Williams before him, in fact perhaps even more uh, manipulative. So yes, I think that the, the sad conclusion that uh, we've reached is that, that uh, Justin Welby has no interest in uh, bringing the serious concerns of GAFCON into the wider communion. That's behind his little dismissive statement that we're a ginger group, a little group of uh, uh, ladies who are sewing circle, who are lobbying for their particular little uh, place in the church. Uh, that's unfortunate. I guess I put it this way. Let, if, if Justin Welby actually took seriously the various things that uh, GAFCON has said over the last 10 years and said, come, let us truly talk about how we can, how I can respond to this, I'm sure that GAFCON would say, sure, let's, let's talk seriously. But he has chosen essentially to ignore it, and as a result, he's forfeited the chance to actually interact with us. It's which much irony that uh, Christian history is full of the little ginger groups who stood up and, and forced change within the group, within the church. So uh, I don't mind being called a, a ginger group. Um, let's move on. Now, I don't know if people know this, but uh, you know, you're retired from uh, Uganda Christian University, and retired people do lots of work. And I've been reading your blog lately. Uh, if people don't know this, you are now a blogger. Uh, tell us a little about your, your blog. Yes, well, um, about two months ago, I decided to uh, throw myself into the world of blogging mm -hmm. a group, uh, with, with a blog called contendinganglican.org. Uh, we've even got a Facebook page. Now, you need to know this. 
Uh, I'm, I'm what I call a, a, a digital dinosaur. Um, I, uh, here is my uh, mobile phone, my, my smartphone. And my son-in-law is going to give me some a whole afternoon of instruction tomorrow <laughs> on how I use it when I go to Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, uh, it so, doesn't have that little thing that you move with your fingers. I, yeah. What are you going to do? <laughs> Uh, my, my flip phone is now in, in the trash, and I'm trying to figure out how. So I'm a digital dinosaur. However, I will say this. Um, I actually started an early uh, version of this because I was the tavern keeper mm -hmm. of a listserv called the White Horse Tavern, which began in 1996 when things began to fall apart in the Episcopal Church. And uh, I actually monitored that for about four years before I went uh, to Uganda. But then I kind of lost the train, and so I've now come back in my second uh, incarnation uh, as a contending Anglican. Uh, it, the, the blog is obviously supporting, in some ways, the book that I've written called The Global Anglican Communion, Contending for Anglicanism. So I've taken the last eight weeks to write a series of posts, which essentially I would call the logic of, of, uh, of GAFCON. Yeah, let's uh, talk a little about the logic of GAFCON. Yeah, well, I have seven posts, and, and the latest one is, I'm going to kind of work backward, which is what I do in my eighth post, which is sort of the octave, the, the summary. And in the last one, I actually take us back to uh, Lambeth, 1998, to the resolution, and I wrote uh, in my book essentially an exposition and how it holds together theologically as a, uh, as a doctrinal and moral statement, including a pastoral outreach to those who are struggling with issues of same-sex attraction. Uh, I think that that uh, resolution still holds up well uh, as a basic statement of, of Christian teaching. Uh, and in one way, it remains, you might say, the, 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 the roadblock, the obstacle which will separate us from certainly the Episcopal Church, but probably Canterbury as well, since it, uh, I wrote another piece um, uh, describing the, the reaction from uh, Canterbury to the Episcopal uh, change of you know, same-sex marriage. I called it Thumbs Sideways. Um, now, you know, it's kind of interesting. One of the things that I've enjoyed in, in my new blogging uh, role is looking for online photographs um, that I can kind of attach to my posts. And so I, I, I looked online for, for thumbs sideways, but I couldn't find any. But, but what I did find was some, some uh, photographs of, of thumbs up. Well, with the marvels of, of rotating pictures, I was able to get a thumbs sideways. <laughs> and so, uh, that was my, my, my argument is that, you know, what we're seeing, unfortunately, in the whole Anglican Communion is what was a universal position of thumbs down on uh, same-sex marriage. And, and now, the, with the arc of history coming in, it's moved to thumbs sideways. And I think sometime after Lambeth 2020, we'll see the Church of England go to thumbs up. Uh, so that's yeah, my. I, I have to agree with you there. Uh, All so right. I, I, yeah, I'm doing those are the kinds of things I looked at in my blog posts as well as others. That's good. Well, I hope people get a chance so before they go to Lambeth to, to preview that. Uh, Two thousand people are going to show up there. Um, it'd be a lot of fun. Once again, a lot of fellowship. But to ask people to keep their prayers uh, for the uh, the statement committee. Uh, we'll be looking for a good statement. Uh, and uh, all the things that are going to happen behind the scenes. Thank you again, Stephen, for your time. Thank you very much, Kevin. Perhaps as we did after, uh, oh, yeah. after 2013, we can have a little post uh, conference uh, in Dama together. Uh, uh, once again, I hope there's a hotel bar on on the top of the hotel, open air, where we can have a wonderful interview like we did before. Where he doesn't, you know, he won't tell you this, but Stephen's on one side of the camera, I'm on the other side drinking my soda, and he's answering the tough questions of Gafcon. I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm Stephen Dahl, and you've been watching episode 408 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>